Okay. Welcome everyone to the 2022 State of the University Address. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. The territory of the Treaty 6 Nations and the homeland of the Métis Nation Region 4. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and for improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures from coast to coast to coast. We acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis and First Nations peoples that call this land home. So please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the effects of residential schools and colonialism on Indigenous families and communities. Please also take a moment to consider the effect of residential schools and colonialism uh, and how we are and can and each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And just a couple of housekeeping items for today. Please be aware that this event is being live streamed and we ask that everyone online, please make sure that you are muted. And everyone here in the auditorium, uh, please make sure that you have your phones on silent. And after the presentation, we will have a few minutes left for question and answer period. We have a microphone available here in the corner. Uh, so please use that to ask your questions so that everyone can hear. If we don't get to your question or if you have follow-up thoughts on today's presentation, please contact President Lorman at president at concordia.ab.ca. There are classes starting right at one, so we will be wrapping up with enough time to make sure that everyone can get to where they need to be. So it is my pleasure to introduce Concordia's President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Tim Lorman. Dr. Lorman is Concordia's eighth President and Vice Chancellor at Concordia University of Edmonton. And he is also a professor in the Faculty of Education. He previously served as Dean of Research in Faculty Development and the Vice President Academic and Provost at Concordia. He has taught in a variety of classroom settings uh, in Australia and in Canada and worked in the Faculty of Education at Monash University in Melbourne, where he earned his PhD before joining Concordia in 2003. His active research interests include inclusive education and pedagogy. So without further ado, I now introduce you to Dr. Tim Lorman. Thank you, Bob. And thank you. Thank you to everyone for, can you hear me? Is the microphone on? It doesn't. You can, okay. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining me for the State of the University Address, both in person and those joining us online, uh, as this is being live streamed. And I believe it's also being recorded. So there may be some people who watch this at a, at a later time uh, when they feel like it. Anyway, I'm uh, Dr. Tim Lawman, and I'm proud to be the President and Vice Chancellor of Concordia University of Edmonton. Uh, each fall, I invite our community to come and join me as we revisit the past academic year and we reflect on the successes and the challenges and we share our next steps for the upcoming year. So for detailed information on the past year, uh, along with some of our success stories, I invite you to please read our annual report, which we have recently published for this year on our website and you'll see that there are a whole bunch of annual reports for past years there as well. One of the efficiencies that we've recently achieved is merging the state of the university report and the annual report together. They used to be quite separate documents. In fact, they were separate documents. Um, and so, but now we've uh, just immersed, merged the two so that what you're hearing today is also what we provide to the government of Alberta. And one of our objectives at Concordia, of course, is to be Canada's preeminent small university. It's an ambitious goal. And I want us to pursue this goal and continue to pursue it without fear of failure. So to me, being Canada's preeminent small university means being known for the quality of our programs, our contributions, our partnerships and our people. We're well on our way. The success that we've experienced in recent years has propelled us forward and allowed us to build some momentum. And now is the time to come together and to keep pushing for more. 
Overall, we had many bright spots this past year as Q entered its second century, and we advanced our work in many ways that we can be proud of. We remain in a strong financial position. We found ways to support our students, to strengthen our academic offerings, and to continue to innovate through the Concordia Innovation Hub, which was formerly referred to as our tech centres, and our scholarly research. We welcomed our university into our new McGrath campus, and our largest campus expansion project to date is well underway. I'd be remiss, of course, if I didn't acknowledge the challenges of this past year. The pandemic continued to impact people and disrupt our operations. It continues to do so today. As we know, there's people who need the option of joining this in a hybrid format, which actually isn't a terribly bad thing. In early 2022, of course, we were impacted by the strike. We are on the path to reconnecting with our community, and there's no doubt that there is much work ahead. I remain optimistic that our community is strong and we are united in our commitment to our students and to Concordia's mission and vision. So today I'm going to give you a snapshot of the following areas. We're going to look at student satisfaction, campus supports, research and innovation, programs and enrollment, finances and facilities, and then we're going to look ahead and at the end I'll invite you to ask any questions you may have. Of course, I can't provide you with comprehensive uh, detail on, in all of these areas, so I do encourage you to read that annual report on the website. I'd like to just take a breath for a minute and share an example of some of the student experiences that we'll be incorporating into all of our recruitment, marketing and communication stuff. And these are some of the students that uh, we featured in this year's uh, view book here. Um, we are trying to develop a narrative uh, from students that other young people will see because most of our students are young um, and that they will uh, see themselves uh, as possibly one of these people in the future who will be able to say uh, a similar sort of thing about us. So very good work being done by marketing and communications in that area. Now we've maintained our focus on supporting our students and on delivering high quality education. So based on student evaluations of the past year, we've really succeeded on this front. The 2022 survey of first year students is the 38th cooperative study of the Canadian University Student Experience conducted by the Canadian University Survey Consortium, CUSC. Easy to say three times. Um, this is the 13th annual survey that Concordia has participated in. And it runs on a three year rotation. So it alternates between surveys of first year students, then the next year they'll do second and third year students, and then the following year they'll do fourth year students. So um, you get a kind of holistic picture every three years of what's going on at a different level uh, at your university. And these surveys allow us to see, allow us to see how we compare to the average for all participating Canadian post-secondary institutions. We also compared our 22 results to the previous first year survey that was conducted in 2019. The survey is implemented Canada-wide in winter of 2022, uh, in fact, in winter of every year. Uh, it collected responses from over 15,000 students nationally, including 289 from Concordia, and our response rate was 49%, which is pretty decent for those who understand how surveys work. It's well above the national average, which was only 31%. So based on the Concordia survey respondents, the typical first year Concordia student, if there is such a, a person, is a 20 year old female from Canada. Compared to students nationally, Concordia students are more likely to be a first generation student, that is neither parent has had post-secondary education, and they are more likely to report having a disability or to self-identify as indigenous or and to self-identify as Indigenous. So four in 10 Concordia respondents reported a disability with mental health mentioned the most op often. And that's not a surprise given that this was conducted in winter this year. Affecting 25% of our first year student respondents in 2022 compared to 17% in 2019. So you can see that increase there is quite significant. Now, as a rule, in responding to CUSC surveys, Concordia students tend to be more positive about their university outcomes and are more likely to be promoters of their university than students elsewhere. This year, however, we saw notable declines on key measures of student satisfaction relative to our 2019 results, ranging from a drop of six, which is a lot, to 17 percentage points 
which is a real want. The impact of the pandemic and the strike undoubtedly had a negative impact on our first year students' experiences. And this assumption is substantiated in the open-ended responses uh, that are included with the survey. When asked about satisfaction with the quality of teaching that they received, 86% of Concordia students indicated that they are satisfied and very satisfied, which is a decent number, uh, but, uh, and it's slightly higher than the nationally reported average, which was 82%, but it is much lower than our 92%, which we achieved in 2019. Almost seven in 10 Concordia first year students reported being satisfied or very satisfied with concern shown by the university for them as an individual. And this is slightly higher, once again, than students nationally, but 17 percentage points lower than in 2019. So I think one of the impacts of the pandemic was that students didn't feel that personal touch that Concordia is so well known for when we see our students face to face in our classrooms and in the hallways and Hegler and, and other places. In terms of expectation, 13% of Concordia students reported that the university exceeded their expectations. And that's lower by 13% uh, than what our students reported in 2019. And it's 3% lower than what is reported nationally. And it's paired with almost twice the number of Concordia students saying it fell short of their expectations. We also saw our ratings regarding the likelihood of recommending the university drop. The CUSC surveys use what's called a net promoter score to measure this. The net promoter score was added to the CUSC surveys in 2018 to measure customers or students, they call it customers, uh, core perceptions of their brand. It's shown to be a significant predictor of engagement and commitment to the brand, the university. Respondents are asked to indicate on a scale of zero to 10 how likely they are to recommend the university to a family a member or a friend. And based on how they answer the question, they're grouped into one of three categories. These categories are promoters who give a rating of nine out of 10, and they're considered loyal enthusiasts who re refer others and help to foster growth. There are people who are termed passives, and they give a rating of seven or eight out of 10, and they're satisfied, but they're somewhat unenthusiastic and the detractors are those who give a rating of six or less they're unhappy and they can really damage our brand by negative word of mouth there's that saying that if you're happy with something you might tell one other person but if you're really unhappy with something you might tell 10 uh, other people about it and i think that rings true sometimes so this year the percentage of concordia promoters dropped to 25 percent from 48 percent so nearly halved uh, in 2019 while the percentage of detractors increased to 31% as compared to 17% in the previous cycle. Our results also fell below ratings nationally, leaving Q with a net promoter score of minus six compared to a score of plus one for universities nationally. This score indicates the percentage of promoters minus the percentage of detractors, and in 2019, our score was plus 25. The slippage in some of these areas is not the fault of any single group at Concordia. They reflect mostly the general experience at Q. I believe that the decline is due to the combination of a number of factors, some within our control and some not within our control. However, we do need to accept the responsibility for getting things back on track, working hard in each of our areas to ensure that students are happy. Our students, right now, a bit more positive news. Our students' ratings exceeded ratings nationally on 11 out of 13 questions where students were asked to rate their level of agree agreement regarding interactions with, quote unquote, most of their professors. On four of them, Concordia's ratings exceeded the ratings nationally by more than 10%, and they remained the same or increased slightly over Concordia's 2019 ratings. So these include encouraging students to participate in class, providing useful feedback on academic work, providing prompt feedback on academic work, and taking a personal interest in a student's academic progress. In other interactions with professors, we saw a slippage from Q 2019 results to Q 2022 results, ranging from one to seven percentage points, but surpassed or were on par with national ratings on most items. Overall, encouragingly, and despite the setbacks in some areas, Concordia students continue to report higher ratings of their overall educational experience and, their profess of, and of their professors 
and students at other universities. So thank you to all the faculty members and staff for their hard work to ensure that our students have a positive experience and receive an exceptional education. Speaking of our students, we recently had a chance to hear from some of them about what makes Concordia unique and how they felt supported to thrive from their instructors and their staff. And we have a short video here. Concordia is different. When I came for like um, the open house, it drew me in. I like the community. I feel like I'm, I would make uh, good memories in here. I would have a good experience. And I was right. Hi, my name is Alejandro Barrero. My name is Nabuin. My name is uh, Kusai Murad. My name is Cassandra Cowan. Daniel Iskalevich. Erica Damsgaard. My major is in psychology and my minor is in early childhood education. I'm a fourth year bachelor's of management student here at Concordia. I'm doing an emphasis in human resources and I'm also the president of the student association at Concordia. Business management with an emphasis in leadership and I'm in my fifth and final year. Science majoring in biology and minoring in English. My major is psychology. I am in the this ID program here in clinical psychology. Um, ever since I came to Concordia, I felt so welcomed by teachers and students alike. And I've been able, because of that small community, to reach out more to more people and get to know outside of my social bubble than maybe I would have at high school or any other sort of institution. Because of that, I have that much closer relationship with my professors and I can talk to them about my day and my homework and maybe try to get that one-on-one. -on -one. Any graduate studies, you really need those relationships. It's all about networking. So being able to do that at Concordia, since it is such a small school, there are certain classes that are offered where it's just you and a supervisor, which has been amazing. So I've been able to actually do undergraduate research and be able to present that uh, at a symposium, which was really wonderful. Um, I do have learning accommodations here since I'm hearing impaired. Education is hard enough just having to learn. It's been really amazing just with all that they've been able to help me with accessibility wise um, for classes has been really great. Um, what drew me to this program in particular was really what it offered. It was very unique. I was really impressed by the uh, emphasis on assessment here at in this ID program, as well as the research options here. I've had some ups and downs in the whole process and the faculty here and my fellow students have really come in to support me and I was teaching at the same time. So being able to help chip in and help out with teaching and just with assignments and giving any kind of leeway that was really necessary was extremely helpful in those situations. I've had several conversations with our Dean of Management, Dr. Allison Yacheson just sitting down with her that I'm confused. I don't know what I want to do with my life. She motivated me to run for these leadership roles to be able to step up. And uh, I think that had a very big impact on me. I wouldn't say it wasn't hard. It was definitely hard. But uh, with encouragement from everyone around me, I was able to overcome that and I was able to actually move forward in my life. I also participated in the Innovation Launchpad starting up my own business. And that is what motivated me to actually be a part of the Bachelors of Management program here. So I think one word that I would use to describe Concordia, and especially the PsyD program, would be innovative and in teaching us really the new things instead of being kind of stuck in their ways of how they've done the program. Community. I would say impactful. Awesome. Yeah, it was a wholesome experience. I'm sure I remember those years as like a fantastic experience so, because I really enjoyed it. I feel sad that's why the last year here, but we gotta move on, I guess. Yeah. That would be passionate. Passionate. Professors are so engaging, so passionate about the work. It's just, it makes me want to cry with joy because it's, it makes me really want to learn. Um, if there was one word that I would describe Concordia with is inspiring. My whole experience has con at Concordia has been very inspiring for me because I've learned a lot from my professors and all of the mentors I've had at Concordia. And this is what I want to say to the future students as well, that trust the process. I know it's hard, but it's going to be worth it when you're actually going to walk the stage with your degree in your hand. So um, 
be prepared to be inspired. So that's, yeah. The pandemic, however, did cause a challenge for many of our students. Accessing mental health services and support students and support services continue to be a growing and urgent need in the past academic year. So demand for student life and learning support services continues to increase year over year. We now call it campus life, by the way, that, that whole uh, area. Compared to last year, we saw increases in the number of students receiving learning accommodation support, which was up a full 20% and tutoring was up a full 75%, as well as increased hours of writing support provided to students, which were up 31%, and the counselling team's individual sessions increased by 23%, significant. <laughs> now, as of this year, 22 out of 25 of the recommendations of our 2017 mental health strategy have been implemented. We made progress this year as training was provided in our community on topics such as mental health, suicide prevention, harm reduction, and sexual violence prevention and reduction. Our annual fundraising breakfast for mental health raised more than $26,000 for Q's Mental Health Fund. And to date, this fund has raised over $190,000. And that's gone towards creating and advancing critical mental health services and preventative wellness programs on our campus, areas that have seen a growing demand throughout the pandemic. Q remains committed to fostering an inclusive campus community that supports LGBTQ2S plus students, faculty and staff. And this year we engage in several initiatives, including partnering in over 24 events with local Edmonton PSIs during Pride Month. Now moving towards greater equity, diversity and inclusion is a long-term journey, one that we take seriously here. And this past year, we proudly introduced the equity diversion, diverse diversity and inclusion framework that will guide students across the university as they build their strategies and their work plans. Over the next year, we'll celebrate our successes, we'll recognise our shortcomings, and we'll continue to build our capacity to foster equity, diversity and inclusion as central elements to our mission. Now, Concordia's approach to research and innovation continues to evolve and to see many successes. Despite the ongoing challenges of the pandemic, we continue to encourage and support faculty, student, and community engagement in research and scholarship. Research dissemination was quite good at Concordia this year. Our faculty members reported 152 publications, ranging from original research articles to books. Fortunately, we were able to relaunch a number of research-focused events that we postponed during the pandemic. This included the annual Q Student Research Forum and poster competition and the inaugural fac faculty research symposium. The Office of Research Services supported student research by relaunching the Student Research Cafe series, where students are able to engage informally with researchers. And this year, Q invited several Indigenous researchers to these sessions, and one event was led by an Indigenous researcher. This year, Concordia signed a memorandum of understanding with another First Nations community to support the development of community-led research projects through the Indigenous Knowledge and Research Centre, which is ably led by Danielle Powder. This year, Concordia's tech centres, which as I said, have been renamed Concordia's Innovation Hub, or the Q Innovation Hub, continued to support Q faculty, staff and students to connect with industry partners and community partners for applied research and commercialization in areas of their expertise. The key areas of focus at Concordia include energy, machine learning, environmental sciences, information technology, and public health. The BMO Center for Innovation and Applied Research supported a range of innovative research activities this year. And this spring, Q's Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence and the BMO Center for Innovation and Applied Research piloted Maya. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's what I've been calling it for the last six months. So I guess it's Maya. <laughs> it's an AI based chat box created to assist learners with cognitive disabilities. And it was demonstrated really nicely at our mental health breakfast this year as well. It's supported by Inclusion Alberta and Concordia Student Life and Learning Team. 
And this spring, Concordia students had a chance to test out the chat box to help with their learning. And I have to say, we also use it in my office. It's got, got a great summary feature. You can dump a 200-page PDF and get a one-page summary. It's very handy. Innovation and creativity continue to be critical parts of the student learning experience at Concordia. The Center for Innovation and Applied Research offered its annual Innovation Launchpad competition, where student entrepreneurs are given support and mentorship to develop and pitch their startup ideas. 67 Concordia students participated in the program, which is incredible. This year, we saw greater uptake and success among students from non-traditional programs of study, such as arts, participating in those areas. I'll take a few moments now to highlight a couple of programs that we are very proud of. First program has been already mentioned, and it's our PsyD, our Doctor of Psychology program in clinical psychology. It's Concordia's first ever doctoral program, and it's the only program of its kind in the westernmost provinces of Canada. While many doctoral programs emphasize traditional functional competencies like assessment, diagnosis, and therapy, Q's PsyD program creates well-rounded clinical psychologists by also focusing on foundational comp competencies like self-reflection and relationship building. In fall of 2021, we welcomed our first cohort of 10 students and we're off to a tremendous start. We met our enrollment targets for the first two years, meaning we currently have 20 high quality doctoral students in the program, with students from five Canadian provinces and one US state. Early data suggests students are highly satisfied with the program, particularly with the quality of the supervision and the mentoring that they're receiving. And another program I'd like to tell you about is our Masters of Science in Information Technology, which is the first of its kind in Canada and a program that has garnered strong interest. The MSC IT program covers topics ranging from the, found, ranging from the foundations of advanced IT to emerging technologies including artificial intelligence and machine learning. Students benefit from an industry internship component where they receive real world experience in a rapidly growing technology sector. The program's designed to give students the technical and the soft skills required to be successful in complex environment. With students receiving direct supervision, mentorship and training from faculty and the BMO Center for Innovation and Applied Research. We welcomed our first cohort of seven students in the fall of 2020, and we quadrupled the number of students in the program in its second year. At this spring's convocation ceremony, we saw the first ever graduating class from the program, and we had students hailing from such far away and exotic places as Nigeria and Bangladesh and Edmonton. After eight years of growth in enrollments, this year Q experienced a modest decline. The total number of unique students in ministry approved programs was 3,248, and the total of full load equivalents was 2,426.6. So we had 0.6 of a, a student there. The, this represents a 2% drop in unique students and a 6% drop in FLEs from the previous year. It's clear that the ongoing impacts of the pandemic contributed to this decline. The uncertainty caused by the Omicron variant, ongoing travel barriers for international students, the vaccine requirement that we implemented to keep our community safe resulted in a number of students withdrawing, both voluntarily and involuntarily, from their programs. These factors, among others, in, resulted in approximately 400 fewer students in the winter 2022 term alone. I now address Concordia's financial picture from a very 10,000 foot, 20,000, 100,000 foot level, very high level. Concordia had another excellent year from a financial perspective. Despite the ongoing impacts of the pandemic, we generated a surplus of $5.5 million over our budget for the 2021-22 fiscal year. And this comes after one of the strongest years of Q's history, where we had a surplus of $11.5 million in 2020-2021. Now, people say, well, you were awash in money. What, what are you doing with all that money? Well, ensuring a surplus is critical for Q. As an independent university, we don't receive funding for maintenance, and we don't receive funding for infrastructure improvements from the provincial governments like our public post-secondary counterparts do. We need to budget with an operating surplus so that we can reinvest in capital projects 
for current and for future years. And it's essential so that we have the infrastructure to support our future student numbers, our current student numbers, and our growing campus needs. Some of the funds from our operating surplus are already saved, are also saved in a rainy day reserve fund that would be used if our expenses exceeded revenue in any given year. And this is critical to Concordia's contingency planning and long-term financial sustainability. Our total revenue for the year was down by approximately $4 million last year. The decrease in revenue was largely driven by lower tuition and fees from the drop in student numbers and from lower investment income, because the markets weren't great. This decrease was slightly offset by an increase in auxiliary revenue, Government of Canada funding and other revenues. The remaining revenue sources remain consistent with the previous year. Overall, our expenses increased by nearly $2 million due to our campus reopening in fall 2021 and the costs that are associated with more activity on campus. We incurred more expenses related to salaries, supplies and services, including professional and consulting fees in the current year due to various new activities such as the Q100 events and labour relations needs. This past year, we expanded our facilities with the addition of Edmonton's historic McGrath Mansion, located near the Concordia campus in Edmonton's Highlands District. Acquisition of this property, property was made possible by the generous $1.425 million donation from the Braxma family. This is the largest individual donation Concordia has ever received in its history. Now named the McGrath Campus, this property will provide a unique gathering space, and in fact already is providing a unique gathering space, and venue for conferences, seminars, fundraisers, and student-centered programming. The McGrath Campus will be a cornerstone of Q's community relations, and we have started welcoming in the public for events. We hosted a Halloween event that saw more than 400 kids attend. We held our annual Lighting Up Ada Boulevard event at the new campus. And we also hosted a family Easter egg hunt that saw nearly 300 children attend with their families. And sometimes those families were six other people. So it was a very busy day there, but a very fun day as well. Now, the growth of our student population in recent years has strained our existing infrastructure. Anyone sharing an office with other people, anyone uh, who walks in Tegler and sees how crowded our students are would probably agree. We need to expand our conference to provide the space our students and employees need to be successful. So in October 2019, Concordia unveiled the Campus Master Plan, which includes new facilities for classroom and for residence space. Now, while our plan to increase residence space is on hold, we have made significant progress in the development of the new academic building. Construction on the project began in September of 2021, and everyone sees it when they come to campus. It's just a, sometimes it's a hive of activity. The new academic building will include 15 classrooms, three labs and prep rooms, two large lecture theatres, 22 washrooms and barrier-free washrooms, 55 offices, and workstations, 27 workshop spaces and breakout rooms, two levels of underground parking, and an indoor quad that will be like an extension of Tegla and a gathering place for the community. We look forward to opening the quad earlier than the rest of the building. We are hoping January of next year, so January 2023. Doesn't give them very long when you have a look at what they've done so far. Uh, and the new academic building, we think, will open in the fall. Let's see if that happens. There's a lot to look forward to. Now, as we look ahead, there are a couple of immediate priorities that I'd like to address. The first is our next academic plan. So with our current academic plan set to expire in 2023, a renewal is in order. So based on what we hear by engaging faculty members and students and others, we'll determine whether we'll renew the existing plan with adjustments and updated benchmarks. We'll go back to the drawing board building an entirely new plan from scratch with new themes and new objectives. Dr. Van Ingen, Bob, is leading this process and has recently communicated about the steps for collaboration on this work. Ultimately, a new academic plan will need to be approved by both GFC and the board, and we hope it'll be ready to launch in the fall of 2023. Now, this spring, we engaged our community and our students, faculty and staff to share their ideas for how we could improve the student and employee experience at Concordia. 
Now, the feedback that you shared was honest, it was thoughtful, thorough, and solution-oriented. My sincere thanks to everyone who took part. We're committed to using your feedback to inform decisions and to making meaningful changes at Concordia. Over the summer, we shared Reconnecting Q, the action plan we're using as we move forward. We've taken this seriously. We've already implemented a great deal of what we said we wanted to do. We'll continue with this important work and we'll keep our community informed. We need to work together and all members of our community need to join us and engage in the solutions. I hope you do. Continuing to get our relationships back on track will be central to our success, both in the short and the long term. The work we're doing now will help to stabilise our university as we emerge from a time of rapid change and, of course, the pandemic. I'm hopeful we're on the right path to seeing a brighter future for Concordia. We are a place where evolution happens, where, where our community thrives and where, after all this time, we remain committed to our core mission of preparing students to be independent thinkers, ethical leaders and citizens for the common good. Thank you so much for your dedication to Concordia. None of this year's successes would have been possible without you. I'm now going to welcome any questions you may have, and I'm also going to thank the people who put this together. It wasn't me sitting at my desk writing this. Uh, Kate, uh, where are you, Kate? You're here somewhere. Kate was led the charge here, and, and Becky and Aaron did a lot of the nice um, writing and uh, the video and the, the PowerPoint slides, but we also had um, contributions from just about every area of the institution, from the registrar's office to the, the VPA's area to uh, campus life, to, so finance, obviously. So everyone contributed, and I must say thank you to everyone. I can't list you all individually, but I want to say thank you to everyone who took part in putting this together. So question. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for that insightful look back at the year at Concordia. Uh, and as Tim said, we invite your questions. So if you don't mind heading over to the microphone so everyone can hear. Dr. Norman, thank you so much. Uh, Jim you, look like you, you look like you're ready to... I am. Going <laughs> for it. Jim Jenner is my name. I'm an, uh, a member of the Board of Governors. I'm from the community. I live in the Highlands. Um, this is more of a comment, so I cut off my mic if I'm out of line. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the things that uh, Tim and uh, your staff that do this work uh, need to be also congratulated on and happened in 2022 is some very active outreach into the surrounding other community, the neighborhoods. Uh, there's been a town and gown organization set up, an advisory group uh, with a very good terms of reference. Uh, Dr. Lorman and others have been working closely with that group to make sure that the, the new uh, academic building and other things have been well considered in terms of the impact during construction as well as in the future on the community. So congratulations there. With regard to the McGrath Mansion, thank you again for that. Um, the neighborhood is referring, it to, referring to it as the McGrath Mansion at the McGrath campus. So there's kind of two parts to that. Yeah. Um, and again, I think the demonstration of Concordia's interest um, and ability, thank you, Judy, uh, for this, uh, in reaching out to the community, holding celebrations there for the community has been really important and, and really uh, a great relation building, a re relationship building opportunity. So thank you for that. That was commentary, no question. And <laughs> but I, I have an answer anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I, well, I, I, I want to say that it's, um, as you know well, and we've had this discussion, up until about four years ago, Concordia really hadn't engaged very actively with the, the local neighbourhood. We were embedded in Edmonton, I think, as a, as a larger piece, but the Highlands, Virginia Park neighbourhoods, we hadn't had a lot of engagement with. And we, the new building, of course, was the, 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 the piece that really made us, forced us, actually, to start engaging better with the community. And I, I said, was saying the other day to someone that, you know, this engagement with the community comes with a lot of challenges, but it also comes with so many benefits and the benefits by far outweigh 
the sort of challenges that that we're having. And it's been, a, I think, a really productive and enjoyable relationship. And I feel like we just scratched the surface that we're only really at the beginning, still even four years later, really at the beginning of, the, of that uh, for us. So thank you for recognizing that and, and for your cont contribution as well. My pleasure. And one more comment as well. Whoever the faculty person was that thought of having the walks in the community and various days over the you know 12 to 12 30 just to know who's out there and see who's out there thank you for doing that i think it's really important that you folks know where you work and where we live so really appreciate that as well so whoever that was thanks thanks, thanks dr Norman. thank you that might have been keely <laughs> was it <laughs> much shorter than you. Uh, my question, you highlighted a lot of our successes over the last year and also a lot of our challenges. I'm curious from your perspective, what are you the, the most pleased with or the most proud of over this last very uh, tumultuous year? Yeah, and in fact, I could roll that really into sort of almost a two and a half year con con continuum there. I'm really proud of how we came through the pandemic. And, and I think that initially nobody knew what they were doing. And I've said this about a million times that our community really stepped up. Uh, everyone in our community, the students, the faculty, the, the staff, our sessional instructors, everyone, our board. Uh, and, and we really came together and we knew that this was a serious thing that was going on, this pandemic and we had better work together for the sake of our students. And we were able to graduate students. Like after two and a half years of pandemic, some students had hardly been in class face to face and they were able to walk across the stage. And that is something I'm the most proud of, that our community was able to face that challenge, but like many others, but I think we actually did it better than many others, were able to face that challenge and to, maintain that concern for our students, even though I think things slipped somewhat, because if we look at the CUSC scores, right, we have to take that into account. I still think that we did a fantastic job together of getting our students the education that they deserved, wanted, and paid for as well. Thanks, Keely. Okay, I'm slightly taller than Keely, but not as tall as the first guy. Um, Tim, you've been, oh geez, you've been present as long as I've been at Concordia since way back when I was a student. So that's a hot minute. Um, and I always love coming to these and kind of seeing the stats and how things have changed. But what would you say has changed most about Concordia in your time here? Um, well, I came to Concordia in 2003. Um, and there were a number of faculty members in this room who were here either well before me <laughs> or uh, sort of around the same time as, as I came here. And Concordia was a completely, in many ways, a completely different place. It was um, very um, faith-based. It was very focused on teaching. Um, and, you know, some people were doing research, but it wasn't the really much that much of an expectation service was i would say actually more of an expectation probably than research and i've really seen that change over the years we've become it was quite a parochial sort of place to be which was pleasant actually <laughs> um but i've really seen this change we've become much more professional and we've become much more that sort of dynamic little gem of a university that i think we want to be where faculty are much more active in research uh, programs um, like more faculty are, are more active than I think in the past. So I've really seen that and I've really seen that, um, especially during uh, Gerald Christmas time as president, I, I believe that he set the foundation for all the successes that we've been having um, since his, his time as president because he, he enabled us to see ourselves differently. And I, you know, I think I credit him with that. So the biggest change to me has been that, that move towards a more sort of professional sort of environment. Uh, whether some people may think that is a negative thing. I happen to think it's a positive thing where we're uh, much more able to sort of swim in the pool with the, the big, credible players <laughs> out there. So I'm mindful of the time. I think we have probably time for one more question. Maybe I should give shorter answers. <laughs> 
slightly smaller. My name is Nathleen. I'm the president of the Concordia Student Association. First of all, thank you for presenting for our um, past and our present right now. My question is actually for the future. What is something that you're looking forward to the most in the rest of the year and upcoming years? Yeah, so first of all, Nathleen, I want to say you are dynamite. You are like an exemplar of what a great Concordia student is. You're engaged in the institution. You're fantastic in your classes, I believe. I don't know. You probably get C's I, I, <laughs> for all I know. But uh, but thank you for, for all the work you do at, at Concordia, first of all. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> Actually, pretty sure she gets A pluses. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, you know, really, what I'm looking forward to over the next year is to is to get back to some sense of stability. And I think this semester has been so far, even though we've only been back a few weeks, has been really terrific for everyone being back, being face to face, starting that personal reaction again. I think that we missed that and somehow, in some ways, lost our way uh, during the, the pandemic. Even though I'm proud of how we we managed the pandemic. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to us strengthening that community over the, the next year. It, it seems like a pretty humble sort of goal for a university president just to say, hey, I want everyone to be smiling and happy and enjoying their work and study again. But actually, it's a pretty significant thing. And, um, you know, I think if we follow that reconnecting Q uh, plan that we have, I think that will go some way and just commit to being positive and nice to one another. Uh, you know, that that's not so hard to do. <laughs> um, I mean, the whole world's grumpy at the moment, and I think we can be different. We don't have to join in that grumpiness that's, that's present in the world. Um, we can continue to be the positive institution that we have been and that I think we still are. So that's what I want for the next year. And then, you know, in future years, of course, I want, that to, I want us to sustain that. I want us to grow our academic programs. I want us to grow our services to students and I want us to grow our research as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today and for your great questions and just wishing you all a great rest of the day. Thanks.